N new friend? N new friend! Ladies, gentlemen, and adventurers of all ages, Baldur's Gate 3 is an absolutely massive game full to the brim with things to do. You genuinely cannot turn a single new corner without finding something worth investigating, talking to, or fighting, but even so, the main quests can be quite an attention grabber, and some of these side quests are very off to the side. So today I thought it'd be fun to direct all of your attention towards five very easily missable side quests or areas that could have a larger impact on your journey through the game as a whole, all of which are in Act 1, all in the first few hours of the game. I'll go through all of them in order of how early you can generally access them, and I'll do this in a relatively spoiler-free manner as much as possible. I will show you where on the map you start a quest line and mention who specifically to talk to, then I'll give you a timestamp for the next quest location if you'd rather just go to the spot, trust me, it's worth it, and then check it out for yourself without knowing what will happen. Otherwise, after the warning, I will go into more full details on the quest lines as a whole. First up then, this one is pretty simple. This one initiates from a cave that is located right around here on your map of the wilderness, which is the first area. Once you cross that bridge in the middle, you can head north and down by the water, you will find the entrance to a cave. If you don't want to know what follows, head to the timestamp that's on screen right now, otherwise I'll explain it in more detail starting here. Walk in the cave and you'll find an owl bear. Various ability check choices lead you to realizing this is an owl bear mother protecting her cub. You have the choice to either back away or kill the owl bear if you really just want to kill something. Either way, unless you kill the cub specifically, it will wind up in the goblin camp to the west just by the entrance over here. You can either kill all the goblins if you want to start a war early, or through various dialogue checks you can simply convince the current quote unquote owner of the cub to give it to you as a present. If you interact with the owl bear and succeed at a bit of animal handling, it'll come back to your camp after a few long rests and it'll hang out at your camp forever, being a part of your merry band just consistently. Worth it, right? Well that's the first one and it's just a bit of fun flavor, but from here on out they get a bit more meaningful and actual reward and shaping the world around you too. All the way in the north of the wilderness by the risen road waypoint, you can head up north through the winding paths filled with knolls. Right by this marker that I have here, there will be a much bigger boss type knoll fight. You can approach it from a few different ways, but pretty much no matter what you do, you have to fight the knolls here. After doing so, talk to the people in the cave to start the quest. If you want to avoid further spoilers, then go ahead and skip to the time on screen, otherwise more detail once again. You talk to the people inside, realize they are part of what is essentially a crime syndicate called the Zentarim. They give you a passphrase to get into their hideout. This hideout is located at Joaquin's Rest, the inn to the west. If you head all the way to the back left corner of this area, there's a shack. Open the door to enter and give the man who is sitting inside the passphrase. He'll let you into the hideout. Progress through and right as you enter the main base and you'll see a gentleman named Oscar beside his art. Talk to him and he will outright ask you to buy him from his current owner so he can go back to his patron in Baldur's Gate and promises rich rewards if you allow him to do so. If you want to follow through with this, talk to Brem, who is right beside him and with proper dialogue check completion, you can even get the cost down to 600 gold. Agree to this and then talk to Oscar who will ask for a further 200 gold to ensure he can actually get to Baldur's Gate. Once you do this, you'll lose sight of Oscar for a while, you'll have spent a fair bit of gold, but he will be there once you reach Baldur's Gate yourself, and of course this decision has an actual impact when you get there. Whether you want to spend the gold and go through with this is up to you, but I thought it was a cool thing to show you all that will affect you down the line depending on your choices. After that we move into the later stages of Act 1, progressing into the next areas. If you have not gone to a proper area past the wilderness yet, I recommend coming back here just a little bit later, alright? The easiest one then is just progressing on the mountain pass west of the inn. There will be some dialogue here, or fights depending on how you interact, and then you can progress into the next area, which is the mountain pass itself. This will take you right beside the Trielta Crags waypoint. Immediately ahead of here and tucked in on the right is the beginning of our third quest. Again, skip to the time on screen if you don't want any further detail, want to work it all out for yourself. Otherwise, here we go. This woman from the Society of Brilliance wants a Githyanki egg. The first step is to get to the Rosie Morn Monastery to the north, which is pretty straightforward and easy to work out, but then once you get there, you want to cross the bridge and head into the large open archway. You can climb in the window to the west here, and then there are a bunch of kobolds the first time that you arrive, defeat them or sneak by, up to you, and then in the northwest corner of the room, you can go outside and do a few jumps like this to go up a floor in the monastery itself. Follow the exact path that I am taking, break any barricades along the way, and the rest of this is just a nice easy saunter through the temple until you reach the lower area with the crèche itself. Thank you. 
Once you are inside, head immediately forwards, do the conversation here and pass the checks, then take a left into a forked corridor, and then on the right side of this you'll find the hatchery room. Jump through here and you have two choices as you progress. You can either choose to steal the egg, which starts a fight with everyone in the room, or just succeed at dialogue checks with the caretaker who will then let you take the egg, no problem. Once you have the egg, bring it back to Lady Esther by the original waypoint, she'll give you a couple hundred gold immediately, and this will also have an effect later on in the story too. It's worth mentioning it is entirely up to you whether you do or do not give her the egg. There is definitely some morality tied to all these choices, but better to know that they exist than not, and if you do this it will have an interesting effect quite a bit later in your adventure if you want to explore what that would be. Our final two quests then are in the Underdark area. There are multiple ways to get to the Underdark, so I won't give you the direct paths, but for our next quest you want to head to this marker within the Underdark. There will be a conversation that I urge you to be peaceful within, and you will unlock some new friends. In this friendly area you want to find the vendor that I have marked here in the corner whose name is Blurg. Talk to him a bit and share your dilemma, and then this quest will begin. If you don't want any further details, skip down to this final timestamp. Otherwise, quite simply, Blurg will summon in a friend from the Society of Brilliance. He will offer to help you out if you can gather a couple of ingredients, and they are a couple of mushrooms from this mage tower in the southern side of the Underdark area. There are some turrets around the place, so you need to play with line of sight as you get close to stay safe, but once you get into the tower itself, you just want to head out of the southern door to access the balcony. Here you can slowly engage in relatively safe jumps on the mushrooms on the side of the tower until you reach the absolute bottom layer. Walk to the garden and grab a magic flower. Bring it inside the bottom layer of the tower to stick it in the elevator, and voila, you have power. Ascend one floor and all of your ingredients can be found in this room. Bring them back to your buddy who wanted them in the first place and a cutscene will happen that I have no need to spoil, but he digs around in your head a little bit, and then he'll talk to you about a powerful ring that might be able to help you. You can offer to bring him some things in exchange for it, or you can simply just intimidate him into giving the ring to you right away. Either way, that ends the chain of quests with you receiving the Ring of Mind Shielding, which gives you advantage against being charmed while equipped. Then we have our final quest of the day. This one isn't really anything that I would call spoilers, so I wouldn't worry about being concerned with this one so much as just, hey, follow this as far as you feel like you want to if you want the help of how to get there, and if you think you can work it out from there, then go ahead and continue on your own. The first step is in the Underdark area, and you want to go to the beach part. Use the boat that is on the western dock, and this will bring you into a cutscene. You can either talk or fight your way out of it, up to you as usual, but the friendly route will always be simpler. Once across, you are in Grimforge. Move to the main chamber of the area over here, which has a lot of the main actual activities that are going on in this area, but you can just sort of, well, ignore them for now if you want to. Head to the eastern side of the room like this, and if you have a character with Fly or Misty Step, or even using Lazelle as a companion, because she has her long jump ability, you can simply just jump up over to the ledge over here. All it takes is one of your characters being able to do this, because right around the corner from that is a waypoint that you can use to bring your entire crew over, no problem. In this upper area, you should do a bit of searching to grab these three items. They are molds for a powerful forge, and they are hard to miss unless you just don't look. By the most western mold, there is a small fight as well, but then down a short path from there is a mithril ore vein. Attack it with magic or blunt weapons to destroy it, and then pick up the ore that drops. Then you can go back up the main path and simply just follow it down towards the forge, jumping when necessary, and on the eastern side, as you're descending, you will see another ore vein in the wall. You have to complete a fight to get over to it, but once you do, you'll get your second piece of mithril ore. Bring it all the way down to the forge, then at the bottom of this area, stick a mold into the forge, specifically the one that you want to turn into an item. Your choices at this point are a mace, scale armor, or splint armor, interact with the center cylinder to stick in one mithril ore, and then hit the lever to the south. This will bring the platform down. Interact with the lava wheel in the corner now that you're on the lower level, and this will flood lava into the lower areas of this forge and begin the actual forging process. But it will also spawn an insanely difficult boss. At least it is if you don't know how to deal with it yourself. If you want to work it out for yourself, you should skip ahead, but this would feel absolutely incomplete if I didn't tell you the easy way to take care of it if you want to have it. When this monster steps in lava, it softens so that it can take proper damage. It always will follow the person who most recently successfully attacked it. So you have one person standing on the lava release, one person standing on the hammer down lever, and one person dragging the boss into the central position by moving across the room with aggro. If you hit the boss with the giant hammer that comes down when he hit the lever when he is softened by lava, it does half of his health, so you want to organize this happening, keep the lava flowing, keep the hammer going down whenever the boss is in the middle, and if you hit him twice then it will actually kill him, simple as that. Really easy as a solution to a boss, it is almost as much puzzle as actual fight itself, and if you don't do this, it is extremely, extremely difficult. After you do this, your first adamantine item will be forged because this area is the adamantine forge. After this, you can eject your original mold, stick in a new one, put in your second mithril, and craft a second item. Using this lets you make two quality magic items super early on,
fun, and it even gives you some choice in which ones you want to create, which is of course fantastic. And that's pretty much it then everyone, five side quests in Baldur's Gate 3 that are easily missable in Act 1, but will absolutely have a larger effect on your game experience if you go out of your way to find them. I hope you've enjoyed this breakdown, let me know if you want more of this as we progress further into the game itself, and I hope this helped to make your journey just a little bit more complete. Like if you liked the video, subscribe to the notification bell for more, and most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, until next time, stay sweet. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage Is, uh, goodbye